Thanks very much, Jan. Um, it's really nice to see so many people here, and I want to thank um, Jan in particular, but also the seminar in general for inviting me. This is very much work in progress, so I'm very interested to hear people's thoughts <coughs> and comments or putting pressure on, on areas of the talk. Um, I'm not a literature specialist, um, but here I'm working very closely with statements that the artist Pierre Soudage, you see on the screen, has made about literature, or more particularly about poetry. Um, so I'm starting, as you can see, and I've put most, I think nearly all of the major quotations are, I've, I've translated them from the French, it's a little rough already, but they're in English on the screen. So we can always return back to them um, if, if people need to. So as you can see, I'm beginning with a response by the painter Pierre Soulage. And this was to questions about his work in an interview of 1980, published in Art Press, which was then, I think, it's only its second number. And as you can see, he says, I don't feel like I'm an expressionist, nor a formalist. I'm not someone who aims at eternal and absolute beauty. For me, painting is first of all a practice, after I try to understand. In saying that, I repeat what others have already said a long time ago. For example, at the end of the 11th century, Guillaume the Ninth, Duke of Aquitaine, and one of the first troubadours, he wrote a poem that is a true proclamation of aesthetic faith. In quotes from the poem, I will make a poem about pure nothing. It will not be about myself, nor youth, nor any other thing. It came to me whilst I was sleeping on horseback. Then towards the end, he says, the poem is done, I know not of what. I'll send it to him who will send it on to someone else, down that way toward Anjou, so that he might send me the counter key from his case, the Comte de Calais. That is to say, the second key that opens it. So this quotation, I think, opens, it in fact has a lot of red threads attached to it, many of which um, deserve more attention including the question of intention. But the rather evident question of intention aside, Soulage emphasizes three features of his work, and these are the keys to the discussion that I'm going to lay out. Firstly, he defines painting as a practice, a learned repetitive activity that works with materials to produce a special kind of thing. The practice itself mixes habit and skill with a kind of receptiveness to chance as part of the process. And in order to understand this practice as much as the artwork, Soulage has recourse to a lyric parable about the advent of a poem. It came unbidden by chance whilst asleep, and the poem's content is pure nothing. That is to say, in Mallarmé's words, a musical void or an eternal absence. For Soulage, as for this famed troubadour author, Guillaume's daydream of a poem presents the riddle of creative consciousness, oscillating between the flute of the inner mind and the concrete matter of willfully chosen words. Building on this recent scholarship by Sarah Kay of troubadour poems, I think this, this particular poem uh, articulates an Orphic quest for knowledge. The third important thing is that the poem contains the answer to its own riddle. Through transmission to others, the meaning will be unlocked. The author is only the initial medium of transmission. The mysterious meaning of the poem requires more than one key, more than one interlocutor. Now, Soulage's appeal to poetry could be taken as a straightforward inter-arts analogy, very typical of high modernism, whereby painting is understood, so to speak, by way of poetry, poetry via music, and so on. And as Peter Dayan explains in his recent book of 2011, Art is Music, Music is Poetry, Poetry is Art, from Whistler to Stravinsky and beyond, the power of the inter-arts analogy depends upon the equivalence between mediums being incalcul incalculable. Thus, the artwork is defended as a unique object timeless in its beauty and universal in its meaning. And in the conclusion to Diane's analysis, he takes Soulage as the crowning contemporary example of this neat circle of hermetic reference. 
Now, no doubt, Sula should, and in fact will be, paired with Paul Valéry, like Whistler and Mallarmé or Braque and Ponge, and seen across the street from Jean Paul Sartre in order to demonstrate the unbreakable bonds of love between poetry and painting at the same time as their incommensurability. But against Diane, I want to argue here that there's a little bit more to Soulage's erudition than a simple inter-arts analogy or sister arts discussion, where we historians ultimately work to maintain the methodological seclusion of mediums. For the inability to parlay medium meaning, sorry, from one medium to another is no guarantee of autonomy, beauty or universality, and nor are these transcendent values Soulage's goals. As the literary theorist Henri Michonic insightfully observes in his study of translation, and I quote, he says, there is more at stake than carrying across a message. The difference resides in what happens on the other side of the river, end quote. So by Considering the translation project at work here between painting and poetry, that is, I think, the river itself, my contention is that we can make considerable gains on several fronts, starting with the study of an artist who became, uh, started making abstract paintings in 1946 and whose significant production continues today at the age of 96. Soulage's repeated references to poetry and semiotic structures point to his alert participation in the keenly fought 20th century phase of an ancient debate over the signifying action of painting and literature. And in 1972, responding to the question, so then, for whom do you paint? Where the interviewer Georges Boudai explicitly echoes one of the three structuring questions asked by Sartre in what is literature, for whom does one write? from 1948. Soulage made plain the importance of this vexed coupling as a means of distinguishing the values he privileges as opposed to those he considers outmoded and valueless. And he said, the painting returns to the condition of narrative prose, for my part, that doesn't interest me. I prefer poetry, and if literary comparisons are made, it's not by chance I refer to them. It's precisely these returns, and he means these kinds of returns, the the work, for example, of Bernard Ossias with the American of 1970, um, belonging to the kind of narrative figuration group that had been at least show, shown in, in Paris uh, from around 1964. So he says, it's, it's precisely these returns to the old ways of painting that encourages me to do that, in which painting has often gotten itself bogged down. I mean, it's this deliberately contentious quote. I mean, the work itself is, is narrative in its structure, and that's particularly what he's referring to. But it's clearly also not narrative, uh, so not sort of an old way of painting. It's a, it's a, a new way of painting using photography and acrylics. But that's a, a side road. Now, Soulage is not an artist poet like Carl Andre or Marcel, Marcel Boutaille nor has he nourished the kind of close relationships with poets that would leave us an archive of frontispieces and book collaborations. But neither is he a mere foot soldier in an intestinal combat between realism and abstraction, or a meta-battle of the arts in order to decide the rank of each medium for all time. The question, held always in suspense here, is the, about the very value of both literature and the plastic arts, of things and signs, provoked by the ancient anxiety over mimesis and abstraction, sustained with particular passion in France between 1940 and 1980. And Soulage's public display of his personal investment in this question underscores the sustained significance of this problem, succinctly summarised by Roland Barthes' faux naive query of 1969, is painting a language? However, few efforts have been made to deepen our understanding of the complex mesh of artistic concerns and often divergent paths within the field of painting, where abstraction is variously and reductively described as lyrical, tachiste, hot versus cold, geometric, concrete, non-figurative, and expressionist. Paying close attention to, to Soulage's position with respect to Barthes' question might in turn encourage us to look again at the volatile status of the lyric in poetry in France after 1946, 
Through the 1950s, when literature is governed by Sartre's edict, banishing poetry from the realm of commitment to action. Into the 60s, when the writers of Tel Kel reclaim poetry's avant-garde potential. To more recently, as Henri Méchonique lambasts those writers who have failed, in his view, to uphold the ethical responsibility of poetry. I think more broadly then, as a consequence, the assessment of the relations between painting and poetry puts critical pressure on our thinking about modernism, such that the totalitarian separation of mediums and methods, thought intrinsic to the modernist paradigm, is rendered heterogeneous. More than gesturing towards something called interdisciplinarity, the tarte à la crème, as Bart puts it, for the late 60s, as much as today, Bart observes, and I quote, it's not the disciplines that need to be exchanged, it's the objects. There's no question of applying linguistics to the picture, injecting a little semiology into art history. It's a matter of eliminating the distance, institutionally separating picture and text, end quote. If in 1969, Roland Bart hopes for a redemptive perishing of the category of painting as much as literature, Jacques Derrida likewise signalled the historical import of a revised form of structuralism emerging in and around 1968, when he retrospectively observed that, and I quote again, the grafting of one art onto another, the contamination of codes, the dissemination of contexts, are moments of what we call history, end quote. Examining modernism's contaminated codes makes it impossible to maintain authoritarian medium and discipline boundaries. It opens up the potential for a pluralized history of art and literature. And I include here the possibility that the aesthetic regime recovers some capacity for an engaged and critical dialogue with ethics and politics. Now, Soulage was clearly thinking about the translation poetry between po um, project Apologize, between poetry and painting from the start. In 1951, as you see here, he affirms, because painting is a poetic experience, it's of the world whilst transfiguring it. This metaphor isn't weakened or explained by any of the coordinates to which we try arbitrarily to make it correspond. At first glance, this looks like willful mystification conforming to the inter-arts analogy rule that such relations are inexplicable and incalculable, made in order to protect the autonomy and the privilege of either art. And to go along with this, Soulage says, I hold the conviction that painting is what writing was for Malamé, an ancient and very vague but jealous practice whose meaning lies in the mystery of the heart. Melamé Mal said that, of course. Um, it's from 1887, uh, in a statement about the poet of Denise Denis Vladim. So here the viewer is left in the dark, literally, as it were, at the mercy of a mute, abstract painting. So Gaj says, painting is above all a poetic experience. Through it, the meaning we bring to it is made and unmade. So he issues an invitation that clearly asks for a pensive viewer who will use their eyes and their wits to unravel the visual riddle of the work. However, the answer may be an unmaking of meaning rather than a conclusive proof. For this is a lyric invitation where obscurity is the real substance of the work. Elaborating on the implication of Beyond the Nights, the Nothing Song, at the point where Soulage's paintings had become seemingly obdurate walls of black. Soulage addressed this conundrum directly. He said, This poem seems to me entirely other and more interesting than poetry is subsequently understood, where there are readings at various levels and where these levels are secrets known to the creator. Whereas in Guillaume's words, there isn't any secret. There's nothing hidden that we must find, but there's a mystery. That is to say, something unknown, including to the writer himself. 
So no secret, but a mystery. Forecasting his deployment of the Nothing Song as an exegetic device, Soulage insisted in 1951 that the situation, quote marks around that, of the artist and of the work, for example, a study of the psychology of the artist, the society in which he lives, the myths and beliefs of the time, is an insufficient explanation of an artwork's meaning. He said, these are not the keys of a work, they are false keys. One bypasses like this the essential. They only tackle one aspect of a work and they don't get into the enigma that it is. Now, Soulage's engagement here with the inter-arts analogy directly responds, I think, to Sartre's manifesto text, What is Literature, of 1948, where the philosopher demands that literature, that is to say prose, deal with the world in transparent language. Not for the first time poetry is exiled to a realm of negation and external absence, with, poetry, with painting as a solitary companion. Unlike Valerie in his essay Poetry in Abstract Four of 1940, Sartre doesn't appeal to dance to redeem poetry, and he opens the first section, What is Writing, by inveighing against those fools who think of the different arts as parallel in nature. But Sartre does, slightly perversely, make the case for painting as abstract when he differentiates the arts so as to clearly illustrate the illegibility of both painting and poetry. He says, here, as everywhere, it is not only the form which differentiates, but the matter as well. Notes, colours and forms are not signs. They refer to nothing exterior to themselves. Sartre points to the mute, unsignifying quality of the thing that is painting and poetry, using the example of Tintoretto's yellow rift in the sky above Golgotha, which he says is not sky of anguish or anguish sky, it is anguish become, become thing. So for Sartre, painting is both blind and impermeable, even Vermeer, he goes on to say, it is no longer readable. It is like an immense and vain effort, however arrested halfway between sky and earth, to express what their nature keeps them from expressing. For Sartre, painting's materiality does not describe, it rather embodies. And here the coagulated bitumen and glass surface in Soulage's trilogy of paintings using tar on glass from 1948 seem to conceptualise and materialise in one visual lesson, the repetitious segue between obscurity and transparency that generates the poetic action of the work. It's not just the unusual use of liquid tar here that might justify Sartre's view of painting's materials as obdurate. The dirty, obscure glass is itself a material metaphor. In Sartre's parable of the arts and their efficacy as communication, the choice of the painter and the poet to consider their materials as things impeding clear sight, speech and action results in their exclusion from a democratic public sphere. Soulage's thick streaks of black tar across the panes of glass might well replace Tintoretto's yellow paint that Sartre then con contrasts to a clear window pane. The window pane's transparency stands in for the instrumental mechanism of perception that permits us a self-conscious, clear understanding of our experience of the world and the direct translation of that experience into words, into signs, into prose, and into action. Sartre, in an, in an inversion of In fact, uh, a poem by Valérie, says, the world is to be penetrated at will like a pane of glass. As Valerie would say, there is prose when the word passes across our gaze as the glass across the sun." End quote. Seemingly despite himself, Sartre valorises the material, imagist, natural and intuitive attitude of the poet or painter towards words and colours, and the value of recognising, in a rather Bachelardian phrase, what he calls the black heart of things. 
but he's forced to repudiate poetry and hence painting on the grounds of unreadability. And again, he uses the material metaphor of glass to make his point, saying, since words are transparent and the gaze traverses them, it would be absurd to slip in amongst them unpolished panes of glass. Exemplified here by Sulaj's tar on glass paintings, this is the only one where the, the glass, in fact, is, a, is still a complete uh, rectangle. The two others um, uh, broke at points but were kept that way. So exemplified here by Sulaj's tar on glass paintings, we can see through not seeing through that unpolished, roughened or obscured panes of glass conceal meaning and prevent our imperious gaze from clearly seeing through to the world. Sulaj's tar on glass paintings and his statements on abstract art as a poetic experience place him in league with those who defend the transgressive, subjective, non-utilitarian value of poetry from Valérie to Georges Bataille and Maurice Blanchot. In 1950, Bataille effectively replied to Sartre in a published letter to the poet René Char, saying, no one can condemn action except through silence or through poetry, which opens, as it were, its window onto silence. And avoiding the question of action, Blanchot morbidly diagnosed the image as at best a phantom that disappears into nothing. In turn, Soulage stresses the complete refusal of the image and moreover, his intransigent resistance to the suggestion that painting is by nature linguistic. As he said here very early on, I made a kind of painting that abandoned the image and that I never considered as a language, in the sense where language transmits a meaning. Neither image nor language. Concurring here with the general understanding of abstract painting and poetry is inimical to semiotic transparency. Soulage challenges any easy reading of his paintings as a legible sign language. Two things are attacked here. The image as either mimetic reflection of reality or as a, a gestural seismograph. And language, see, similarly seen as representation. Crucially, poetry is understood to be independent from language where language is defined as the system of rules governed by the representational structure of the sign, that which here Soulage associates to a theory of the image. Soulage's paintings here supply evidence for Henri Mechonique's long-standing defiance of the sign. And in his book, Soulage, Le Rythme et la Lumière of 2000, Mechonique argues that the control of the sign of meaning is here homologous to that of representation of painting. The sign prevents us from seeing that the classical opposition between representation and non-representation of the world is the same in language and painting, and in both cases says nothing about what art is, specifically as invention of the world. I think as is uh, uh, repeated often in Mechonique's work, he argues against the structuralist disjoining of the sign enforced by a semiotic division between signifier and signified, as in, is, in his view, this produces a static and imprisoned form of language. Consequently, Mechonique repudiates a narrow and individualistic conception of lyric poetry that he accuses of calcification into the sign of an isolated consciousness. <coughs> Mechonic here builds upon earlier critiques of the romantic genius as origin of hermetic insight and the mechanistic technology of technique that by 1950, if not well before, in both poetry and painting, was held responsible for an academicised alphabet <coughs> of lyrical expression. Clearly sensitive to this kind of critique of lyricism, primarily literary in origin, Soulage explicitly positions himself outside of and even against what was heralded by art critics in 1947 as lyrical abstraction, la lyrique. He protests against the celebration of gestural abstract art as a form of authentic self-expression or a revelation of presence or a state of the soul. 
In part, I think PSU <coughs> was surely reacting to the hyperventilating language of critics such as Charles Estienne and Michel Tapier, as well as to the overt psychologizing of the paintings of Rolls, who you see on the left, who of course most famously was psychologized by, by Saar, um, and the spectacular and histrionic painting performances uh, of Georges Mathieu, who you see on the right there, and whose, whose work is typically linked to far off historic events in the past as a sort of gesture of reenactment of, of, of usually spiritual issues connected with those events. However, as early as 1962, Soulage looked back and acknowledged that his own early paintings conformed to stylistic expectations of this anti geometric form of abstraction whereupon the brush marks tell a dynamic tale of the body's movement in space. He said, my abstract painting showed an experience of movement, a graphism that looked like the inscription of hand movements, and this figuration of movement upset me. More than a figurative anecdote, it was a romantic anecdote. Lines path, sewn with tremors, forceful surges or falls, proposing to the spectator to relive the states of soul in which it's a kind of registration. I rapidly abandoned this route. And in this interview, this is a kind of particular kind of interview where he says this. Uh, I'll show you the, the image in just a second. But it comes from a document called The Trial of Soulage, Procès à Soulage, which was um, a, a kind of you know, a rhetorical manoeuvre in many young ways by young communists um, in 1962 to kind of bring abstract or modernist painting you know, back into the realm of, of left of centre thinking about art. Um, so they, they took Soulage as their example and they had a, a witnesses for the, for the artist and, and uh, testimony against and this is part of Soulage's own testimony here where he looks back over the sort of decade and a half of his public work. He then went on to outline what he did next. He said, I began to group the always large brush strokes, these lines being from the start coloured surfaces, into a sign that delivered itself in a single glance, in an abrupt manner. Narrative time, that of the line which follows the eye, was thus suppressed. So talking here about the dark configuration on a light ground that characterises Soulage's 1950s paintings, useful counterpoints can be found in the older artists Hans Hartung, Gerard Schneider, both of them close to, I'm just sort of setting a little bit more context here, both artists very close to Soulage, also Henri Michaud, uh, equally um, an important um, older figure, um, or Soulage. All of these artists, Hartung, Schneider and Michaud, with significant degrees of experience or exposure to surrealism and the debates in particular on auto automatic writing, automatism. We can also start to set Soulage in the company of younger artists emerging onto the Parisian scene around 1946 like him, such as Jean Delotex and Olivier de Bois. And as you see by the title of Olivier de Bray's work on the left there, Senior Personnage, uh, um, he openly affiliates his paintings to some kind of figurative sign, however abstract in appearance. And for Delotex on the right hand side there, an association with the lively milieu of lettrism, noisily revising established ideas on semiotics, but also with surrealism proper, with its continued investment in the fate of automatism, resulted in Delotex's work in a thoroughgoing examination of the painting as sign work. Now, Soulage had distanced himself from surrealism and automatism publicly in an interview of 1949, and as we already see, has an ambiguous rapport with the notion of painting as sign to core. And in 1963, interviewed by philosopher Jean Grenier, Soulage contrasts paintings that show a continuous line in space, and I'm using the Degatex on the right hand side as the, the counterpoint for him. So he contrasts these kinds of paintings that show a continuous line in space 
and hence function in his view as an emotional and corporeal seismograph to his own paintings containing a much more condensed, spatialized configuration. And he insisted that this more unified relational ensemble, such as the work there from the date of the interview, introduced another kind of reading. Simultaneity replaces the continuity of line, corresponding to a different gaze, a different look, and hence to a different kind of time. Sartre asserts that against language, the painter doesn't want to draw signs on his canvas. He wants to create a thing. In opposition to the sign image, then, the artist privileges the artwork as a thing. And it seems like Soulage <coughs> agrees, because more than once in many interviews, he said the painting is not a sign, it's a thing. And several practical decisions made early on by the artist establish, it seems, the painting very clearly as a thing. Uh, the nominal titling, so from 1947 onwards, the works are only titled as Penture, Dimensions and Date, and that's the complete title. Against the trend in particular of so many abstract paintings titled Composition, for example, he abandons the frame, and he later installs the works, and I'm sorry, it's not the greatest image, but you can see that in particular in this space here, which is the um, fabulous Cullen and Hall by Miss Van der Rohe in Houston, uh, built in the late 1950s, if I remember rightly, that the paintings are hung in space, right? And they're not framed, so you see the chassis behind and, and walk around the entire object. So front and back are visible. Aware, however, of the danger of reverting to a kind of metaphysical materialism that is in itself a form of idealism, Soulage acknowledges, he says, neither image nor language, it's like this early on that I thought painting. However, I never considered that painting could be reduced to its materiality. So he's very, he's very clear about that. For Soulage, the flow or translation between materials, technique and the imagination, that is to say the practice, the tempering of materials by an intelligent hand is how thinking painting might be said to work. An experience whereby the work's material substance is evidence of a manner of working that derives from both the body and the imagination. And this for Soulage is poesis. The crafting of the work, the knowledge of the properties of materials and how to temper them, so that the imminent work of the imagination becomes visible, concrete and poetically powerful. In, a radio, in the radio interview of 1951, to which I've already referred, Soulage argued that painting possesses a superior poetic power, completely unlike words. He responds to his interlocutor, Georges Chabonnier, who himself follows Valérie, to suggest that words destroy their meaning once aggregated and used. In painting, says Soulage, it's the opposite. He says, what counts are the relationships that are established between forms and colours, and through them, their sense of poetry. It's when the individual identity of forms and colours disappears, when they are no longer separable, that the dynamics of the imagination, rhythm and space emerge, that their poetic power is born, end quote. This is the beginning of a determined effort by the artist to identify the relationship between poesis and the poesy of painting, so as to frame abstraction for the public as a form of visual thought, materialized in, sorry, manifested in material form. And here the painter is far from mute. In one of the most telling moments of this exegesis, on trial, as I've described to you, for the crime of, of abstraction in 1962, Soulage is even more uh, explicit, and I think I've got the quote on the next page, but um, this is the kind of document that is the Procea Soulage, as you can see in the cover and article from um, the Union of Communist Students in France. And uh, the photograph there, just by the by, the one I'm showing you next is part of a sequence taken by Isis 
in the painter's studio, and it's the first time that he allows a photography into actually take a almost a cinematic sequence of works. Um, um, I think it's a very particular decision taken by the artist to, as it were, um, show the process. So here's one of the close-up works where he says, the brush strokes were there, not as the singular consequence of a self-interested gesture, nor serving states of the soul to which they could testify, but for their pictorial qualities. I meant by that their surface, I've always, he says again, used large brushes, their form, their material, for the space created by the relations of form to ground and between each other. These marks were there for all of the expressive power and poetic potential that their physiognomic qualities could carry. So he tells his audience how the abstract work is framed, and by that I mean shaped. Soulage reverts to an older sense of framing and making to which the term poesis belongs. In his own practice equally, he abandons the usual quadrilateral enclosure for pictures that became dominant at the end of the Renaissance, along with other framing devices such as perspective, which Soulage equally rejects. The pictorial surface is organised by the framing of space with tempered matter, paint, fluid becomes solid, on glass, it's self tempered substance, or on canvas, which is also tempered by preparation. As the imagination is catalyzed and the body responds with practice skill, meaning isn't located beyond the work, it is produced in and by the work, according to the artist. He says, the only way I have to speak of the sense of space in my works is impossible for me to detach from my manner of working. In a talk entitled L'Espace, given at the invitation of the philosopher Jean Val at the Collège de Philosophie on the 27th of April 1953 and subsequently published in the Belgian literary review Le Disque Belt, Soulage consolidated his theory of the spatialized relationship of the imagination and the exterior world, that is to say on the translation between the self and world that is brought forth and made manifest in the thing that is painting. He said, space is a dynamic of the imagination where there's no reason to impoverish a poetics in refusing it. I think that painting that is truly lived without arbitrary constraints, without artificial bias, takes note of our space precisely in creating its own. So I think there are two kinds of space here. The space of the imagination, his, ours, paintings, and the physical space of the work that interacts with our physical space in the world. And I think Soulage here is quite literal when he explains that the poetics of space, space is both the internal medium of the work as rhythmic intervals are registered across the canvas in a form of pictorial prosody, and the external reason for the painting, where the space of the imagination is given a material presence. Time runs through space, as Bergson always tells us, and is articulated by intervals or rhythm. Time is announced by the soulage in the titles of the works and given visibility by the rhythmic conjugation of forms in space. However, this is not duration or narrative time, nor an instant. It's something quite different. Time is condensed and held temporarily immobile in a pictorial capsule. And he recounts this here in a sequence of statements. Towards 1955, the sign disappeared, he said, and the brush strokes were juxtaposed and multiplied. From their repetition and their relations thus established between these forms, almost alike one to the other, is born a rhythm, a rhythm of space. The rhythm I'm talking about is born when one form is linked to another thus producing the experience of space and its division on the canvas. The accents, the strong points, the tensions, also the calm, the weight, the depth of certain surfaces. So he describes here how a prosodic organisation of brush strokes in space produces a pictorial rhythm of light and dark, of depth and surface, shifting across a space that is delimited by the size of the canvas in practical terms, but in fact is continuous in nature. 
The invocation of rhythm might suffice to explain the basic relation of form to ground. However, Soulage wants more, saying, I hoped for more from rhythm, from this beating of forms in space, from this cutting of space by time. Space and time stop being the milieu in which the painted forms bathe. They have become the instruments of the poesy of the work. More than the means of expression and the support of a poesy, they are themselves this poesy. However enticing it is to stay with pictorial formalism, Soulage's preoccupation with rhythm is the poetic structuring force within a spatially and temporally expansive force field finds its most persuasive counterparts in the intense theorizing of rhythm by both literary scholars and social philosophers in and around the 1950s and 60s. I think here in particular we might look to the influential discussion of the literary archaeologist Emile Benveniste, who contributes to the importance of pre-Socratic philosophy in France during the post-war years with a precise analysis of rhythm as flow, which he translated from the original Greek to be couleur as a river. He draws from pre-Homeric lyrical poetry in the Animus philosophers in his analysis of rhythm. Rather than distinct intervals, rhythm, says Benveniste, quote, designates the form in the instant it is assumed by what is moving, mobile, and fluid, the form of which has no organic consistency. It conforms to the pattern of a fluid element, end quote. Now, Benveniste's most significant inheritor has been Henri Méchonique, who in his Critique du Rhythme of 1982, and again with reference to Soulage in his book of 2000, argues for rhythm as a force that abolishes the opposition between the oral and the written in discourse analysis to indicate what words do as much as what they say, with sounds, stress symbols, repetition, ellipsis, syntax, pauses, phrases, etc. And more than this, and not reducible to mere metrics, Rhythm indicates time and governs meaning in a continuous and renewable movement. For Benveniste and Valérie before him, and for Soulage and Méchonique, rhythm does not equal harmony, any kind of metric progression or a fixed structuring principle. Its measure is unpredictable and unquantifiable, its flow interminable and its significance resistant to decoding. However, the expression of rhythm and the sensual apprehension of rhythm involves an active and self-conscious subject. Building upon Benveniste, for whom, and I'm quoting uh, Mechonique here, for whom discourse isn't simply the usage of signs, but the activity of subjects in and against a history, a culture, a language. Mechonique is clear on this point, saying, there can be no theory of rhythm without a theory of the subject and no theory of the subject without a theory of rhythm, end quote. So this is just that, the last short section of the paper. Time has been the central preoccupation for Soulage since his first abstract paintings of 1946, where the date of completion became part of the title. What Mechonic would call the historicity of each work is identified precisely and placed within a series of works in a time zone defined as the continuous living present. Soulage says, each painting is at the same time a finished painting and that which matters more to me a stage, a moment of something more vast than that is the succession of my paintings which I'm unable to foresee." End quote. Um, I deliberately chose the work of 4th of May 68 um, to just sort of put pressure on that question of history still. Soulage, in a manner admired later on by the authors of the so-called new novel, Claude Simon, Nathalie Sarot, as well as Michonique, and participates in a rebellion against a progressive narrative conception of time and proposes in its place a radical historicity of the present. Against the instrumental force of prose, equated with both representational and expressive use of language, and distancing himself from an emotional or one-to-one -one identification with the work, Soulage asserts, when one finds the direction of a course, you're on to expressionism. You say to yourself, look, here the painter trembled. 
with emotion, etc. You see, one uses like this a past tense. Myself, I prefer painting in the present. Present tense, in the present. But this affirmation of the present must not be misunderstood. Soulage does not deny history, dating his paintings precisely and acknowledging their place in a series that occurs over the long duration. He explicitly inserts himself into a timeline folding in upon itself and forever reoccurring. Similarly, proclaiming par le futur le présent pour toujours, Meshonik declares his faith in the transformative insertion of the subject into the rhythm of time, into history, not via the historicist looking back at the historian, but by situating life as a creative act in the historicity of the present. In Meshonik's view, the artist or poet bears a particular responsibility to act as an advocate for this transformative adventure. He says understanding and meaning are put to the test by each poem if it's new. Poems teach that there is something else aside from understanding, and they do it differently. In an absolute engagement, poetry or painting is the creation of something that does not merely reproduce the world as is. From his first public statement of 1948, Soulage has affirmed the transformative potential of each painting as poetic and abstract, objects of translation between world, artist and viewer. This is an existentialist stance, an answer to Sartre on his own ground. In 1950, defending abstraction in the widely read journal Esprit, he reminded viewers that they could not be passive bystanders. The painting itself is a total engagement, he said, a poetic testimony of the world whose validity is abandoned or left to the spectator. One asks nothing of the spectator, a painting is proposed that is seen in all liberty and necessity at the same time. The position adopted in front of a painting of this kind depends upon and responds to one's general attitude in the world, and this with all the more force given that the painting does not divert one to something exterior to itself. So Soulard speaks, it seems to me here, of the artwork as a thing that enjoins us, viewers, and, and I'd include the artist there as the first viewer in the scene. To inaugurate an always new, beginning again process of becoming subjects of knowledge, that is to say, both possessing knowledge and being subject to knowledge. The authentic lyric artwork, whether troubadour poem or abstract painting, obscure, ambiguous and mysterious, functions as an unconstrained space where imagination and world meet and where we as subjects find some kind of freedom. The lyrical value of the artwork is an invitation to open up the enigma, to acknowledge the mystery at the core of knowledge. Soulage says it isn't a simple representation of space that one meets there, but lived space, true or well-proven space felt in a poetic experience. Each artwork is situated in the imagination and our experience of space that in which we live and put to the test every day is included there. So Soulage describes here a space or scene that is simultaneously ideal and interior, that is to say it's in our minds, and it's exterior, the form of the painting, and as a thing in relationship to our surrounds. This enticing, ambiguous space is at once familiar and strange to us, and so our encounter with it is deeply unsettling. The artwork invites us to enter the gap or space between what we know and what we seek to know. This is a dramatic space of freedom, of nothingness. I've never supplied a user's manual for my artworks, Soulage exclaims. The mental work that ensues as we explore the mystery encourages a gain in consciousness that pushes the subject, the viewer, the reader, to enunciation of the self. And moreover, this dramatic, poetic encounter with the artwork creates the open relations of intersubjectivity and knowledge that are the bedrock of transformative social ethics. And so Guillaume the Ninth of Aquitaine concludes, I think little knowing that the keys to the empire of poetic knowledge are lying beside the painter's brushes. He says, my songs all made, don't know what on. I'll send it to someone so he, through someone, sends it 
onto someone in Anjou there, who from his box will send the contreclay to what stays here. And that's the translation of W.D. Snodgrass in, in the morning.